It's undeniable that the global pandemic has changed many of the ways in which we think about the workplace and how many workers actually go about getting their work done. While not all work can be done remotely, we've learned that many types of work can be done remotely or with some types of flexible arrangements. This realization isn't going away, and leaders now have to face this challenge head on. In this episode, we discuss. Welcome to the Indigo Podcast, an exploration of human flourishing at work and beyond. I'm Ben Barron of Indigo Anchor and Cleveland State University. And I'm Chris Everett of Indigo Anchor. For more information, please visit us at www.indigopodcast.com. This revelation isn't going away. I can see executives (laughs) everywhere. They're like, how do we get this cat back in the bag? Look, I got my hands are covered in toothpaste. How do I stuff it back in the tube? I shh, now they know. Now they know. And they can't unknow. Where's That's those right. guys from the Matrix? Maybe we could just put something in the back of their spine and plug them in and turn them back into the automaton numbskulls that they always were before. Yeah, it's interesting, right? Now we know as uh, many workers at least have realized and many organizations have come to the realization that, hey, you know, we can do this. We can do this remotely. And like you said, you can't really make people unknow that. And so today we're going to talk about this leadership challenge of remote and flexible work. And we're going to talk about what's actually going on right now. We're going to talk about unpacking this leadership challenge that's being faced by many executives and managers. And of course, we'll talk about some implications for people, leaders, and organizations. So just to set the scene here for our listeners, let's talk about where we are right now, what's actually going on right now with regard to remote and flexible work. Well, one of the things, it's the number one trend for 2021 from the Society for Industrial and Organizational Psychology's annual list of top trends. Mm -hmm. So out of all the stuff that they look at and do, this is the number one trend. That's right. So, you know, they, every year, the Society for Industrial and Organizational Psychology surveys its members and asks, you know, what do you see as the top trends? That's kind of survey number one. Survey number two, they say, well, here's what you said. We kind of put it in some categories. How would you rank these? And the number one trend for 2021, you know, perhaps unsurprisingly, is remote work and flexible work arrangements. And so we put some links in the show notes where you can check out all of the top trends as well as more information about them. You know, each one has some ongoing updates, which is really great. So you can kind of keep track of that, as well as a link to a white paper written by Kristen Shockley of Baruch College, which she wrote back in 2014. It's on telecommuting, but it also has some relevant information in it. Uh, so, you know, a lot of kind of interesting findings. And by the way, one of the findings that she talks about in that white paper is that job satisfaction is highest at moderate levels of telecommuting. So about two days per week. And a similar pattern was found with life satisfaction. So, you know, even back in 2014, people were liking this, seemed like a good idea. And of course, now that we are moving into this, uh, I hope we're moving towards a post-COVID era, uh, it's starting to, you know, become uh, more of an ingrained part of our reality in the workplace. Yeah, you know, enterprise level business says, all right, you guys got to all come back from working at home. And you could probably see a Spotify spike of Twisted Sisters. We're not going to take it because <laughs> <laughs> they're playing it. People don't want to go back. But let's let's take a look at be sympathetic to the orgs. What work schedule really makes people happy? Well, it's whatever I want in the moment. And so if mm-hmm. you had no work, you know, I know some people that, man, I sold my dot com or whatever. And, and now I don't know what to do with myself. They're bored. They're missing work. But if you give everybody nothing but all you can eat work, they're like, gee, I really want some time off. I want more time to see my family and stuff. And so you can see that in the data, right? Two days. You know, I want a little bit in, a little bit out. And I guarantee you put everybody on a two days, you know, four day work week that everybody fantasizes about. You give them two days on and then two days, uh, you know, two days in the office, two days at home. Give them long enough. And there's this thing called hedonic adaptation where you (laughs) adapt and you'll start complaining about that. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not stuff that you can't improve. But let's be honest about the reality of being human, being basically monkeys walking in shoes, that there's nothing perfect that an organization can do. And even if you were in charge, you would want to change it week to week, month to month. And you can't run an organization that way. 
<laughs> yeah, I think that's a good point. We do get very quickly uh, adapted. We quickly adapt to our environments and you know that which brought us a whole bunch of satisfaction at one point, maybe when it was first instituted, it kind of comes back to the mean after a while. We see this with pay increases, but I, you know, I, so I think that's a point well taken. And I also want to acknowledge right off the bat that this trend of remote work and flexible work arrangements, this isn't a trend everywhere, right? <laughs> there are still many, many jobs that you can't do remotely, many, many jobs that uh, you just can't have a flexible work arrangement, you know? So you think about different aspects of the service sector and hospitality, you got retail, you know, shipping and logistics, um, agriculture, healthcare. Just Your plumber can't work from home. You know, that <laughs> leaky toilet doesn't get fixed through. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just load up the Zoom. I'll tell you what to do and then mail me $100 an hour. That's that's not how it works. And, you know, there's, there's a bias here. And there's a bias in industrial and organizational psychology. There's a bias in a lot. Of, well, podcast listeners tend to make more money. And, you know, they're not necessarily somebody that's working at a chicken plant in the middle of nowhere, Alabama, yeah. you know, where I lived for a while. Um, there's there's just a bias. And meanwhile, on the backs of a lot of what might be traditionally called blue collar jobs, we got to stay home. Mm -hmm. And and people say, well, gee, and some of our clients, Ben, right, have said, you know, the people had to come in and work at the manufacturing plant while all the executive team and HR and managers all went home. Why? So they don't get covid. And, right. you know, the guys have to show up like, well, what am I chop liver? I believe in the vaccine. I want to get. You know, there is a bit of, I mean, it just ain't fair, to be honest. Right, right. Well, and so when we talk about things like, you know, working remotely, having these flexible arrangements, I think there is a tendency, and, and for various reasons, for us to focus upon the primarily uh, white collar knowledge work, um, you know, and, and I would say that, you know, one of the reasons why we have focused so much in, on those types of jobs in the world of industrial and organizational psychology is a lot of times those are the larger organizations that employ industrial and organizational psychologists. And they oftentimes have enough employees to create a data set where we can actually analyze this stuff using some, you know, fairly robust statistics. It's just hard to do that with, this, you know, with a very small sample size. So, you know, that's part of what's going on here. I would say that, you know, within these larger organizations and we, you know, even some of the mid-sized ones, we have seen a change though. And that's what we're focusing on here in this episode, uh, this idea of remote and flexible work arrangements and how it you know, really presents a challenge for leaders. Uh, but maybe we'll take a step back and talk about, you know, even before COVID, um, telecommuting, flexible work arrangements, these were increasing in popularity and prevalence even then. Uh, it was really COVID that just took it and really accelerated it. But there was a lot of this going on even back then. Yeah, so from the white paper that's in the show notes, 63% of employers allowed some employees to telecommute, telecommute, telecommunicate. I can I can sense what you're thinking, Ben. <laughs> no, to telecommute occasionally. And it's funny, the names for this, telecommute, work from home, you know, all, all these different things. But 63, so close to two thirds people let, you know, employers let people do this occasionally. And about a third, 33%, allow some employees to telecommute on a regular basis. Right, right. And technology certainly has made this easier. This would not be as possible if we didn't have the, the good communication technology that we have. If you didn't have, for example, high-speed internet in your house, it would be very difficult to have a Zoom call with your employer. So we see a lot of that. Now, of course, over time, since 2014, when that white paper was written, all of this has continued to increase rapidly, uh, you know, but this overall conversation about flexible work, what the work day, the work week, even, you know, the work life should look like. This has been going on for a long time. And I'm not talking just a, you know, a decade or so. It's been going on for much longer than that. Yeah. For as long as people who have worked, there have been people bored at work thinking about it. <laughs> 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 probably probably so but the thing is is we got to get some context like we we're talking about that hedonic adaptation we adopt to the level of hedonism we get at the moment be that one work day work week two day work week whatever but way back in 1869 uh president grant ulysses s grant he issued a proclamation to guarantee 
eight hour workdays for government employees. And so once you do it in the government, then, I'll, you know, if everybody else is requiring 16 hour workdays <laughs> or, or like an old boss of mine used to say, you know, what's good about a 24 hour workday or 24 hour day, Ben, is that there's three eight hour workdays in it. How many <laughs> can you do? You know, so but once you did that in the government sector, which is a huge, you know, national employer, private sector workers push for those same kind of things or they just leave and go work for the government. So, you know, private employers had to follow that. And then in 1926, Henry Ford did a 40 hour work week because he had done some research on his own. Right. This is early in the kind of management science. Like, how do we think about this stuff? And he said 40 hour work week yielded only a small increase in productivity that lasted over a short period of time. So when he started looking at conceptualized, what was he looking at there, Ben? Yeah, well, I mean, he well, he was looking at the, the amount of time that people were spending at work. And he realized that when you made people work more than 40 hours, that there was really a very small increase in productivity, you know, that it seemed like there was a natural limit of some sort that you got diminishing returns on that extra labor after 40 hours. And so, you know, that was 1926. Now, of course, there's much more history going on here than we're going to really have time to share because certainly a big part of this was the labor movement and how unions played a role in all of this. We've came across an interesting piece of data, though, that, uh, you know, back in 1928, the economist John Maynard Keynes predicted a 15 hour work week within a century. And in 1965, a Senate subcommittee predicted an even shorter 14 hour work week by 2000 with seven weeks of vacation. So people have been fantasizing about this for a long time, and it certainly is not a new topic. Uh, 1938 is when the big piece of legislation got passed. It's the Fair Labor Standards Act, which required you know employers to pay overtime if people were working more than at that time is 44 hours. Then it was amended a couple years later to be 40 hours, and so it kind of became standard in the United States at least for there to be a 40 hour work week in 1940. It doesn't apply to everybody. You know, if you're exempt from that law, then it it doesn't apply um, if you're that type of worker. Um, but this is a, a certainly a, a concern that we've been wrestling with for a long time. And now we're adding on top of those concerns, not just the duration of work, but how the work is actually being done and where it is being done. You know, we had COVID and that certainly has caused a rapid shift in many sectors. Yeah. And so, you know, way back in the day, how many hours do you work? All of them. You know, if you're a hunter gatherer, well, when's the workday done? Well, when we get the buffalo or whatever, right? You know, and that persisted. We've had some pushback because we have some things we got to do in our private lives. This idea of going to a 15 hour work week and the emergence of like <laughs> leisure. Right. Yeah. We had to. I don't even know when the word leisure came into, you know, existence, but, you know, definitely became more common at that point. And now we're in this struggle of competition with our competitors who could maybe drive their employees harder. And people who want to have a good life. And, you know, we want people to have time to raise their children, right? So they don't become numbskulls because then your future workers are, are garbage. So, <laughs> you know, it, it becomes this circle. But it, it's so prevalent that a recent survey indicated that a majority of workers would choose a permanent work from home option over a $30,000 pay raise. And so I did the like on the napkin math. If you have two weeks of vacation then that's about 125 bucks, if I remember right, a day that they're willing to forego in order to be home. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating, right? And then that same survey uh, suggests that people would absolutely look for a new job if they weren't allowed to continue working remotely in their current position. And so kind of as we started this episode, we were talking about how you know COVID brought this big shift in terms of how work is getting done, we can't put that cat back in the bag, so to speak. Not that you should ever put a cat in the bag. That's a weird expression. But, you know, we really can't unlearn that. We've realized that it can work, and now people have adapted to it. So now employers are going to have to figure out, how do we make this work long term? This isn't just something we're going to do during a pandemic. And, you know, what we also see is that many employers are prioritizing or at least publicizing, uh, you know, because they think that people think it's important, you know, this idea of remote and flexible work arrangements so they can attract job applicants um, because people are valuing those types of things. But this presents a real challenge. But pe people will say they'll do all sorts of stuff. 
you know, back, forget about the COVID vaccine. Back when we had the anthrax vaccine, a bunch of people were saying, I'll get out of the army if I have to take this. Line up and get your anthrax vaccine. Okay. <laughs> you know, so, you, you know, right? You get this, the survey, the IO site comes around with this clipboard, nerdy glasses and says, oh, excuse me, sir. What are your plans if you have to go back to work? And he's like, I ain't going. Right. <laughs> but But when his boss says, get your rear end in your seat back at work, He's like, okay, like yeah, there's going to be a lot of that. It's hard to know how many really true because they'd have to have another remote only position to go to. That takes time. We're still in COVID. So it's hard to know. That being said, this is the number one trend for 2021, according to PSYOP. So we're going to talk about it. Right. And I think we can at least say that, you know, because this is a, a certainly a, a thing that is on people's minds, people are thinking about this. It is maybe one of those things that people value as they're maybe evaluating different job opportunities. Uh, you know, and this is, of course, assumes that a person has more than one job opportunity. If, if a person does have that, then they might be looking at, hey, well, does this one allow me to work from home a little bit more? What does the flexible work arrangement look like here? But this does present a real challenge for leaders, for management, and there are a handful of them. I think one of them is, you know, many organizations, at least good organizations, work really hard to build and maintain a productive culture, a culture in which people feel valued, a culture in which people have a similar idea of what success looks like, how to get things done in an appropriate way. And maintaining that culture in the face of geographic separation is difficult. So that's one challenge. Yeah, another one is managing people when you can't see them. Right. Right. Wait, wait, I, how do I know that my team's working hard? I mean, I need to look over the field of cubicles and see furious typing. Mm. I hate loud typers, by the way. But <laughs> anyway, you know, that's that's how they know. But how do I know they're not doing doing some laundry during our Zoom session or, you know, <laughs> our weekly team? You know, people ha don't know how to do that. You know, a lot of them don't know how to manage people when they've got them in front of them either, too. There's that, <laughs> you know. Point well taken. Absolutely. You know, you bring up the point of how do I know what they're doing, you know, when I can't see them? It's interesting because, OK, imagine you do see them all. How do you know that some of them aren't daydreaming? Right. <laughs> how do you know that some of them aren't if you can't Amazon ordering? Yeah, right. Yeah, they're <laughs> shopping for shoes. They're they're doing some cyber loafing. Right. And, you know, I guess your your IT folks could tell you that if you're uh, surveilling them. But managing people when you can't see them, I think it's it's definitely a challenge at least a perceived challenge that many managers have and one that people are going to have to deal with even more now. And then I think there's this broader kind of category of, of the challenge, which is around communication and feedback and relationship patterns um, that you have among supervisors, direct reports, and teammates. And because we do know, you know, fairly conclusively that relationships at work matter in terms of, you know, the degree to which people value each other, how they communicate, when they communicate, um, the willingness of people to give each other feedback and receive that feedback, all that's very important. And without the social cues that we have from face-to-face -face conversation, it can get more challenging. And so let's move now to really trying to unpack this leadership challenge a little bit more that executives and managers are facing with this increased prevalence of and you know, potential, uh, you know, long-term uh, flexible arrangements at work, remote work. Um, and, and, you know, we, we really kind of boiled it down into three different food groups or categories. Yeah. But before we get into that, I, I want to just everybody to put their imagination caps on and see a blank field. Now, imagine you've got an internet provider. You only have one in your area and it's Comcast. At least that was the, you know, we hated those guys. And they didn't have to provide the best service because they were the only provider there, right? And so they did the minimum amount and they knew they'd retain their uh, customers because who's going to go without internet these days, right? Don't be that employer. When it comes to, you know, race, gender, pay, benefits, any of that kind of stuff, you're like, well, what's the minimum we can give these guys and, you know, <laughs> get them to do stuff? And then I just wonder why these guys aren't engaged. Right. That's not how you need to think about that. One, that's immoral. That's not treating other people on the planet as real human beings. And second of all, it's not a winning strategy. So with your imagination hat, 
I want you to just say you're starting a new business. This is where as a leader or head of the organization or even a mid-level manager, anybody that makes these kind of decisions, you put on your strategy cap as if this was your own organization. So when you look out at the employment landscape, there's going to be people that are willing to work uh, on premise, and there's going to be people looking for remote jobs. If you want to secure the best talent for your organization, you're going to say, hmm, you know, we can get this guy, but, you know, he's a remote only person. You are going to build your organization to be resilient, to ingest, promote, develop all the stuff you would do before there was a big, big remote thrust in a diversified landscape because you want to be flexible as an organization. So to Ben's point, we've kind of brought this into the leadership challenges people face for this kind of environment goes into three food groups. And you're going to need to address these things as leaders and people in your org. Communication, two, level setting the load and managing the work, and three, stakeholder management, that's above, across, around, impression, impression management, how you represent your team in the workplace, uh, reporting, and then on going productivity issues. Right, right. So these three different categories of the challenge, um, I think are are distinct ones, and we'll, we'll talk about them a little bit more in detail. Uh, and you know, these are certainly challenges that you have regardless of the environment as a, as a leader, as a manager. Um, you know, communication is always something you're working on and making sure that the work is being distributed correctly and managing stakeholders. But these are all a bit tougher in a remote or a flexible environment. Maybe for a variety of reasons. Maybe one of those is that we're just more accustomed to seeing people, to communicating with people in person, to getting those social cues and reactions from people's nonverbal communication that help us understand what's really going on. Uh, when we don't see people, it can be harder. And so part of the leadership challenge is, you know, you've got to be, you, you always had to be a good leader. Now you've got to be an extra good leader. <laughs> but we're going to kind of talk a little bit about what that looks like. You know, another piece of it is that there's just, you know, the added stress and, you know, we're seeing some burnout, a lot of, you know, really challenging types of circumstances that, em that employees of all types are facing from all of these quick changes, all of the business uncertainty that's been added to the mix that really has come, up, come about because of the pandemic. Um, so I would say at the end of the day, you know, the same types of principles of being a good manager and a good leader and dealing with working from home, these still apply, but we're going to talk about kind of how this, this really can um, manifest itself in some other ways here in a, in a moment. Yeah. And you say the same stuff applies. And the reason this is a challenge is because so many organizations, I'm not even going to venture a guess how many, my cynicism wants to say too many, a lot, um, is you have low-functioning managerial staff and, and executives in your org anyway. They haven't really been developed. They've taken a monkey-see, monkey-do approach to how they've learned everything. None of this has been professionally vetted by the literature. And so you have untrained leaders. That would like, Ben, all right, I want you to take these 10 people that haven't shot a weapon before and go charge that hill in Afghanistan, so to speak. <laughs> you know, like, but that's what they're doing all the time. They don't want to take the time to develop people. So even, even the in-person management struggle, and then you throw COVID and you throw uncertainty, you throw a odd global supply chain environment and all these other business stress stressors and a remote for workforce. Yeah. You know, you didn't invest in leadership development training before it is biting you now. And we see this <laughs> acutely in all the popular media, all over LinkedIn, in conversations with our clients, you guys should fix, you know, check yourself before you wreck yourself in that regard. But that's why, you know, you were struggling before with remote and hybrid environments. You're even struggling more now. Right. So I think many organizations are reaping what they didn't sow, perhaps, right? Instead, they should have been really focusing on leader development. And of course, you know, this is a, a point that I'm naturally very sympathetic to, that leader development matters and training people matters. I think there's good research support for that claim that these things matter. Uh, but those organizations that have neglected that and neglected it more than others are really going to be trying to play catch up here because these leadership skills to that you need to address the specific leadership challenge 
posed by increased remote work, increased flexible work arrangements, really require a next level of leadership. And, you know, it's really a lot of the, the basic skills done even better is kind of the way I think about it. So, you know, the first piece here, I think, is really around communication. You know, when we were prepping for this episode and we were looking at the research, communication is all over it. And it's just harder when you're not in person. Yeah. So one of the things you got to do is be super specific. You can't leave anything into ambiguity, right? So lots of times when we coach people, you know, it's like, well, I told them this. Well, let's see it. Well, yeah, you kind of made it as an offhand remark at the end of a meeting, you know, where you verbally tell them, you send out an email document, maybe this is what I expect or what I need done. And then you have a time for a brief back. Hey, in your own words, could you tell me what am I expecting from you, right? Those kinds of things. So verbally and in action, you have to set your expectation. You need to create a feedback culture to where people feel okay with saying, you know, boss, you're bad at giving directions through email. You do it better <laughs> verbally. So we better chat verbally so I can hit home runs for you. Yep. You know, how? what kind of things do you got to say to where your team knows I need feedback? We need to be able to give each other feedback. And it's a safe place to do it. And, you know, people knock the safe place thing like, oh, what a bunch of mamby pamby kumbaya. But who wants to live in a violent place? <laughs> like, come, come on. So make make it a safe place to where people can give back feedback. And it, and if you're not getting the feedback, then you need to ask why. And then you need to start expecting feedback. To, you may have to prime the pump to get that going. Yeah. So clarifying expectations is always important for managers to do. They really have to be explicit about it when you're talking about working from home and flexible work arrangements. Um, because that thing that we take for granted of being around just isn't there anymore. And so you've got to be explicit about how you're going to communicate. You've got to be more uh, willing to listen and have open idea sharing. And, and also, you know, praise people when they bring up good ideas. Uh, that's going to encourage that good feedback loop that you really want to have. So, you know, I think your, your communication as a leader is even more important in a remote environment. Uh, you have to think about, can your team and is your team really understanding what you're saying? Um, or are they just kind of guessing after you hang up from the Zoom meeting, right? It may require you, and I, I would strongly recommend using multiple ways of communicating with people. You know, we have text. We have the Zoom call. We can also just use this other feature that we all have on our phones, which is actually calling people and talking to them about things. That could be really powerful as well. Uh, have multiple ways to really ensure that people are on the same page with you. And this kind of goes back to communication 101, but there's this idea of active listening, you know, where you, you listen to people without trying to judge what they're saying, without trying to think about what you're going to say next. They say something and then you repeat it back to them. You paraphrase it back and say, so what I'm hearing you say is, right? And this is a great managerial skill regardless of the environment, but I think in a remote working environment, when you're not seeing people and you really want to make sure you're on the same page, that's a great technique. Right. And also know that a lot of leaders that we end up coaching and working with don't know that they're bad. And sometimes they <laughs> just, you know, it's a bad leader that got on a good team. And so they say something. And as soon as the boss is gone, every I've been on teams like this, Ben, I'm sure you have. It's like, well, what the heck was this person saying? Right. I don't know. Hey, Filson. Why don't you do this? Okay, I'm going to do that. What? You know, and then you start, you're triaging the ambiguity behind the back, maybe even emailing somebody on another team about expectations. Hmm. And then you're making your boss look good by not failing, right? Well, when people are remote, it's harder for them to triage that lack of direction, right? So you have to get that. And like Ben, one of the things you mentioned was praise people that bring stuff up, right? You know, not just good ideas, but if somebody says, hey, boss, I don't think you're doing this so well, highlight that in the meeting. Guys, you know, I'm embarrassed. I've been doing this horribly for eight months now with you guys. And Filson was the only one brave enough to bring it up. Filson, way to go. I'm taking him out to lunch, you know, and and guys, help me help you by being a better manager. I don't want to be horrible and you don't say anything. 
if you have that kind of thing, people, you know, you might get a delude, delusion or uh, a deluge of feedback, but that's great. That's better than not having feedback and having people triage behind your back. Yeah. So listen to the Filsons out there. Filson is doing a lot better. You know, when we first started this podcast, Filson was screwing up all the time. And, you know, he's really turned himself around. I think he's going to get himself promoted here soon. He is the one who's out there telling the boss, hey, boss, here's something that you need to do a little bit better. That is a gift. That is a gift that you receive as a leader from the people who you're trying to lead. So, you know, I think you also just need to, with regard to communication, be more intentional. All right. So I think one way to think about this is about establishing what we call in the military a battle rhythm for your communication. And what that means, and it's kind of, you know, a, uh, a jingoistic type of term, you know, referring to warfare, but um, a battle rhythm is just like, OK, when and how are we going to communicate and give updates to each other? Because that's so important on a military staff. You know, one other thing that we say on military staffs, which is, I think, a really great thing to keep in mind in any organization is you should always be thinking about to yourself, what do I know? Who else needs to know it? And have I told them? Right. If we can all keep that in our minds as we're going through our work, I think we'll be a lot better off. So, you know, are you going to have, for example, daily stand up meetings or huddles, something where you all get on the phone for a few moments to talk about what you, you're going to do today, what you got done yesterday, what's in your way, maybe kind of like the, you know, a scrum type of stand up if you want to some sort of huddle, a check in. Um, and I think you can do this both formally as well as informally. You know, I, I think. People might appreciate, they might think it's a little strange at first, but they might appreciate if you as the boss just kind of off the cuff during the workday, give people a call and just say, hey, just want to check and see how you're doing with stuff with no real agenda, you know, um, once in a while. I think that that could be really, really powerful just to make sure that people truly see that you care about them as a person, that you value what they do. So, you know, I think you can do these types of things for work, work related items in, in, in terms of having that battle rhythm of communication, but also to ensure that you're, you're, you have a pulse on people's well being, that you are making them feel valued, and that you're recognizing their efforts. Right. You know, in the uh, workplace, Ben, they have this thing called the RACI chart R A C I. And you put the kind of task or information or piece on one axis, and then you put people's names. And you put a R, A, C, or I, which is responsible, like this person's responsible for that piece, accountable, you know, that maybe a group project gets done, consulted, this person needs to be consulted before you do X, Y, and informed, this person doesn't need to do anything with the work, but we got to give that person the heads up. Use some of these tools, go into Google and do, you know, self-organizing team tools, pick up some of these tool sets that will help you on communication and to create a platform for people to uh, get along, integrate, and deliver high-quality work product. Now, within that, right? You know, so you have good, you've improved your communication. You've created a safe feedback culture, all that kind of stuff. Psychological safety. You have a battle rhythm. Some of the stuff you got to do is build a culture that's inclusive of people in different places. So sure. some some people have a happy hour, right? Or you know. Tea, tea at two on Thursdays. So the team, it's, you know, it's mandatory f family fun time. And you might bring up the suggestion and you get a lot of groans, but just watch it. You, you do it. Those new rituals that you're making for your team, people start will miss them if you get rid of them. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, any culture in an organization, which has to do with those unwritten rules about how things get done, those assumptions that we take for granted, the values, what we really care about, how people interact. All those things are very important for any organization. And when you're not in the same physical location and you're working more remotely, having these more flexible arrangements, you, I think you have to be more intentional about maintaining and creating that culture. And I think the way to do that is to be mindful of what culture is and what different elements of culture can be the different what we call artifacts of organizational culture. So as you mentioned, you know, different routines, you know, maybe that piece of your your communication rhythm that becomes part of your culture, uh, perhaps, you know, how you recognize people when they do something well, how you greet newcomers, how you recognize those people who are maybe retiring or leaving the organization. Um, all these different formal and informal ceremonies and rituals and norms, even the funny stuff. 
I, I think is is really important. Actually, I think humor it, it's that's not just kind of a, an aside. Like humor is actually really important. I think to maintaining a good culture. Um, all these can be adapted to virtual work. You just got to be a little bit creative about it. And what I'd recommend to managers is focus on the communication, focus on those regular things you do in terms of uh, ceremonies. And I'm not talking about like, it doesn't have to be like the formal ceremony, but the things that you do on a regular basis to recognize people um, and those rituals, how you greet each other, how you talk to each other. Those are very important pieces that then can really promote a culture, regardless of whether or not you're geographically separated or not. You know, my wife worked at a sales organization that was like high stress, high stake kind of. And when you would nail a big sale, you'd have to get up on the conference table. They'd put on the boom box really loud and you'd have to dance while people cheered you on. <laughs> it didn't matter. Guy, girl, you're a bad dancer. That was that was. And I'm not saying do that kind of stuff, but you can see how like rituals and stuff need to take on the flavor of the kind of organization you sure. have. Right. But just as important as what you do do is the important things that you don't do, like respect your employees boundaries and respect your boss's boundaries. It needs to be OK to turn off at the end of the day. And if you're the boss, you need to set the example on that. And it's like, hey, Filson, this better be good because I want your marriage to survive. Yeah. Mm. Filson's married. You didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> He's married. He pulled it <laughs> off somehow early in his life when he wasn't doing so hot. But right, Filson, I want you to stay married. Don't call me on the weekend unless it's important, right? You can yeah. set the tone for that kind of things. And it also helps you communicate how you view urgency around certain priorities and projects, right? For sure. It can just be so challenging when you're working from home for extended periods of time, which I've been doing now, by the way, just for our listeners, I've been doing this for several years now, right? Now that we've been into COVID for a long time, I've been teaching remotely, doing this type of work and doing a lot remotely. Um, it can be very hard to turn off at the end of the day. And if you don't have boundaries that you create yourself in terms of, oh, I am not going to check email after this time, or I am, you know, this is when the workday ends for me. And I think you can help people do that through how you communicate with them as a manager. And, and you know, it, I think a lot of this is by example, right? So if you say, hey, I don't want you guys working after five, but then you go and send a whole bunch of emails at, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten o'clock at night or four in the morning, that's sending a little bit of a message to them as well. So I think you got to respect those boundaries. Also, I mean, people have been talking about this for several months now, if not the past year, but Zoom fatigue is real. Having, you know, the, the fatigue of trying to stay on while you're uh, on camera and, you know, talking with people. I've had several multi-day uh, trainings and conferences that have occurred in a video environment like that. It, it is very tiring. And, you know, you're spending a lot of energy trying to read people's social cues and so forth over the camera. So be careful about, you know, just because you can schedule a Zoom meeting very easily doesn't mean necessarily that you should. Yeah, same rules apply. You know, you finish a meeting, you're like, that could have been an email. Well, yeah. make it a daggone email at this point in time. Mm -hmm. But you can't read people. And especially when you ingest new team members, right? They don't know the norms and cues. So be really deliberate of, you know, maybe at the end of the meeting, guys, I'm feeling really good about this meeting and where we're headed. And maybe even mention somebody, if you feel like you're picking up some mojo, Zoom, it, things get lost in Zoom translation all the time. If you think, well, gee, Ben over there, he doesn't look like he's too happy or doing stuff, but I'm happy with his output. You might call it out. And Ben, I'm feeling really good about your efforts as well. Mm -hmm. You know, just be really specific in communicating those things. Another thing is, you know, there was these studies around people that use emojis and text messages are perceived as less intelligent. Um, and I can't remember where that was. You know, I'd have to dig it up. But um, sometimes you can use those emojis to display emotions in an appropriate way. Mm -hmm. You know, like if somebody tells you something, you might give a thumbs up and a big smile. Right. But if you just give a thumbs up and it's like thumbs up, it's like, OK, I got it. Quit annoying me. <laughs> right, thumbs up doesn't tell, you know, maybe add a bit of emoji to it and mention, hey, I'm going to use some emojis so you guys can know exactly how I'm feeling, because otherwise, how would you since we're remote? Yeah. And I would say to the manager who maybe is scared about what you just said about don't use emojis because they're going to see me as less competent. 
if you've established your competence and you're working hard on behalf of your people, they're not gonna. It's not gonna make you look worse. I don't think if you're if you're using some of those uh, emojis to try to convey another level of communi- you know, communication or emotion with your people. Um, you know, so another piece that I think is important to think about in terms of communication is taking a collaborative approach towards getting work done. Now, of course, this matters, COVID or not, uh, remote or not. But I think it really can be even more important in a flexible arrangement or a remote work environment because people are necessarily, by definition, in different environments as they're working, right? And so getting their different perspectives is even more critical in that type of scenario. Yeah. And on the communication front, you know, some people I know in the military, you have a brief, the commander sits at the end of the table and he says, all right, S1. S2. And it's, you know, round the table, round robin. Okay. And then the commander puts out his dictation of what he wants to happen now. That's one way to do it. If that's a norm in your organization, the challenge with that is that you are the single point of failure for communication, mm-hmm. right? Everything has to come to you. And so you, you may keep some of that. Sometimes that's appropriate, right? Um, but sometimes you can take a more collaborative compl- approach on communication. You know, hey, Ben, why don't you go onto the whiteboard here digitally and draw what you're thinking? And then you become more of a facilitator of the communication. You ensure understanding. And it's less of this more command and control kind of, you know, round the robin, brief brief the highest paid person in the room type thing. Yeah, that's great. So we provided some practical tips on communication with regard to a remote work environment, a more flexible work arrangement. Let's talk now about that second group, which, you know, we kind of referred to as level setting the load and managing the work. Let's talk about some practical stuff there. And one, I think, great way to approach this is kind of a mindset of, hey, I need to approach this as a strategist, as an owner of this type, this piece of work, of the business, right? How am I going to get this done? And then involve your team in problem problem solving how you're going to get the work done. Right. That's that collaborative piece, right? You know, if you want to fire on all cylinders, you want to capture all the thinking, creativity, and inputs and outputs of your team. So involve your team. But you need to be really, and this is kind of like the communication piece, right? You need to be intentional about painting the picture for what success looks like. Hey, we're successful when we ship 100 units a day at above a 95% quality score or something like that, right? By being very clear, if you can co-develop what success looks like with your team and then hold yourself to the own standards that you set as a team. But people feel ownership when they're involved with what success looks like and with solutioning how to get there. Yeah, yeah. People really do take ownership when you involve them in the solution process, if you're doing it genuinely, I think. Um, So you've got to be intentional about it, help paint that picture for success. You know, part of the way I think about this a little bit, too, as we're talking about this is, um, you know, it's a little bit in terms of my professor role. It's a little bit like the difference between teaching in person and teaching online. And I found that teaching online, you actually have to be much, much more deliberate about thinking through what the work is, what success looks like, and how I'm going to communicate about it. Same thing goes here for a manager who's trying to figure out how am I going to get all this stuff done? Um, you may not know because of people's different arrangements what their capabilities are or how they're going to interact with the work. And that's why I think it's even more important in in a flexible arrangement to put out what success looks like. Here's where we're trying to go. Now together, how are we going to get there? And that way you can try to figure out as a team how we're going to handle the work, how we're going to distribute, who does what, and have some clarity around different roles. Yeah. And as your strategist, rather than I'm just Joe, director, senior manager, VP type person, you start thinking, you know, VPs get this, directors start to get this stuff. I need to think about how many, well, do I need 20 members to do this work? How many could be remote if I have to, you know, people are refusing to come back in. Do I need to have 10%, 20%? How am I going to handle the culture? I want to work from home too. Ah, oh, but we need at least 10 in, you know, like, you're going to have to think about how to manage the team culture around those items and how are you going to distribute the work among team members. Now, if somebody says, hey, I got to work from home, but because I have to pick up my child every day from school, I need to be gone from 2.30 to 3.30 in the afternoons. 
Well, if there's a critical report that's done at three o'clock, well, you're not going to be able to distribute that report to that person to be due at three o'clock, right? Right, right. And so a lot of this has to do also with thinking about what output, what productivity really looks like. You know, we've become accustomed, or I think that some managers are accustomed to the idea that, well, as long as I can see them coming in at eight and leaving at five, they're doing their job, which is an illusion, first of all. <laughs> it's important to note that that's an illusion. Uh, but in a remote environment, in a flexible environment, you've got to be more intentional about that and thinking like, what kinds of things do I want to see? Is this, that, cause that will help you understand whether or not um, you know, things are moving in the right direction or not. Now, I think it's also important to remember that it depends upon the type of work. Some types of work are very easy to quantify, very easy to measure. You know, the, the number of widgets produced per hour. Now, you're probably not going to be doing that remotely anyway, but, you know, different documents, different production of different things. Like, we can count those. Um, but many things also are, are not easily quantifiable. Uh, the knowledge work, the creative work. And so, you know, that's where you're going to have to ascertain whether or not someone's doing their job through that ongoing communication and feedback that you have with that employee about their work. Right. And there's this idea called ROW, R-O-W-E, and that's results oriented work something. What, what, what's ROW? Environment. Is like, Environment, is the, right? It's yeah. like, hey, let's focus on the results, right? What comes out? Did we ship 100 widgets? Great. Or did we, you know, generate this many trouble tickets? You know, great. You know, those kinds of things. That's a great way to think about it. But to your point, Ben, that doesn't always work with knowledge work. But then if you're not careful, if you're only focused on the results, then you lose the people connection and culture. And so, yeah, you have a bunch of remote working team, but they're just all cogs in the wheel. And you also lose the ability and desire from those people to want to contribute beyond just cranking out widgets at the beginning of the end of the day, right? It, it sets up a transactional work culture and environment, which can be okay, honestly, for some things, but it might not be where you want to be with your team. Right. So I think along with this kind of goes that expectation setting piece, helping people understand how you're going to evaluate them, how you're going to know whether or not they're doing a good job or not. So we've talked about the first two areas of communication, some practical tips there, and some pr practical tips on level setting the load and, and so forth. Let's talk about some practical items for executives, for managers, with regard to this idea of stakeholder management. You know, How do you manage relationships above and across the organizational chart, um, dealing with impressions uh, and so forth in a remote or flexible work arrangement? Yeah, so you've done all this work. You've learned how to be a good communicator. You've learned how to manage a distribute team and ensure that they're still productive and generating about his stuff. And now you're about to get fired. And what? I'm about to get fired? Well, you didn't tell your boss or your boss's peers and the other people in the org what a good job you're doing, right? <laughs> you're hitting home runs every day and you're about to get fired. Don't find yourself in that position, right? And, and this is where you need to have regular check-ins with your boss. You know, if you just have an automated report that goes out every at Friday every week, and it, you know that as long as that sends out and has the right numbers on it, you won't be bugged, you need to set up maybe a bi-monthly or monthly at a minimum sync and just share with him how things are going, right? If your boss, if she, you know, isn't checking in on you on a regular basis, you've got to do that. And this is a time for you to show them how smart you are. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, we ran into this. I just wanted you to know we're facing these challenges. Oh, so, you know, um, about 40 percent of the applicants for any job that I post are remote only. You can share these kinds of things. You can become a strategic advisor and trusted confidant to your boss by managing up. But it's also managing across. So if you have other teams, let's say, there's four other managers managing teams just like yours. Maintain a good relationship with one of them. If somehow there's a reorg and you got to be looking, you want to have solid, all those in-person networking skills that you need to have as a manager, as an executive, you need to execute and be, because it's remote, right? 
super deliberate about building the relationship. And if you can, maybe getting a coffee, go on a hike or walk or whatever you can do to build those relationships, not only above, but with your peers, right? Yeah, I think that's really important. And, you know, this idea of having good relationships with your peers makes me think about the the number of times that I've done 360 evaluations with leaders, you know, where we got insights on their leadership behavior from not only the person's director, their boss, but also their direct reports and their peers. And sometimes I'll find that maybe a whole group of people within an organization do a great job up and, and even a good job down, so to speak, on the organizational chart, but they do a bad job laterally. They do a bad job of maintaining good relationships with their peers. And yet that's really, really important for success in any organization. And I think, as you mentioned, you've got to have a much more deliberate approach towards maintaining and building those relationships in the flexible work environment. So that's definitely a piece that I would recommend for folks. Yeah, one of the things with stakeholder management, and this is maybe you're at the VP level, maybe you're the CEO, is you kind of come up with what productivity should look like and you think it's fine. And, you know, maybe 80% is remote workers. And meanwhile, they're sandbagging. What right? do you mean by they're, that? They're, they're, they're saying, oh, yeah, yeah, look, we're hitting all our goals. We're hitting all our goals. But what if their true capacity was 10 times what they're doing? Yep. And you see this in the budgeting process. All right. So, Ben, let's just play, you know, you're you're my director of operations. I'm the VP of operations. And I say, all right, Ben, you know, um, it's budget time. Let's talk. Listen, I want the most work out of you for the least amount of money. What can I get for this, right? <laughs> and then and then you turn and talk to me and you say, well, you know, Chris, you know, that looks good. But really, I want the least amount of work for the most amount of budget. I want to be able to hire 10 more people than I need. I want to be able to have it. And both people are not really focused on a collaborative in, uh, alliance. A collaborative alliance is a word I like to use to how do we move the organization forward? So you've got to curate those conversations of, hey, give me the most for nothing. Give me everything for nothing. That's not the right headspace. And so as somebody that's at the executive level or even up the C-suite, you need to have ways to check in and make sure your productivity isn't getting, you know, buffered. Where yeah. they're, you know, because people will organize around the most pay for the least amount of work. If they're smart, <laughs> they will, right? Sure, sure. Yeah, incentives do matter. And um so, you know, I think we've we've shared some good ideas around practical things that, that people can do and, and really unpacking this leadership challenge faced by folks who are, you know, staring down the barrel of more remote work, remote work and flexible work arrangements that are here to stay. I'd like to, as we start to kind of wrap up this episode, I'd like to address a really important uh, segment of the workforce. And that's those folks who are not in management, right? And maybe you have no desire to be in management. First of all, that's okay. We need organizations and people who are awesome individual contributors. And I think all organizations that do a good job with managing their folks realize that, at least they should. Uh, but I think in a flexible or a remote working environment, and if you're not a manager, you're reporting to people, You have maybe you have some teammates, maybe you don't. I think you still, as to, to really maximize your influence and your productivity as an individual contributor, you do need to be more, more proactive in that environment. Yeah, it's the same as that person that you can't just manage your team, you got to manage up. Well, if you're a team of one, say you're a, like a Cisco, a firewall expert or something like that, and people come consult, you, you have no desire to manage anybody, you still have to manage your personal capital within that organization. You are a brand. You are a brand in an army of one, so to speak, right? So keep in mind, out of sight, out of mind. Don't be forgotten. You know, sometimes you might have a bad ball, boss, one of those numbskulls, and we did an episode on bad bosses, but you may be a numbskull that has a guy that didn't get trained and he was bad in, in office. Now he's really bad remote worker managing. Just set up stuff. Hey, boss, you know, um, this is how I'm thinking about work right now. Um, what do you think about that? Okay, great. That's good. I'm just going to touch uh, base with you with this type of report on Friday. Would you look at this sample report and tell me if that's good enough for you? Oh, we're going to make a few changes? No problem. You'll get that every Friday. And I want to talk one-on-one -on -one at least once a month. How about it? Shall we yeah. do the first Tuesday of each month? You know, those kinds of things. You become so trusted. Man, this person's self-organized. They do everything. And 
And then I can just sit around on my bad manager laurels and and this, I'm, <laughs> you're not going to get fired with that kind of boss management, right. right? Well, what I love about what you were saying there, Chris, is it's about, Hey, you're, you're an individual contributor. That's where you want to be. That's, that's what you love. Um, and that's fine. Uh, and maybe you're not getting the management that you really need. You can create that environment by being proactive, you know, just, just try something, see what jives with your manager with regard to reporting, with regard to communication. And, you know, your manager will most likely either say, Hey, this is all great. Love it. Uh, or they may say, Hey, you know, you don't need to send me everything or, Hey, I need a little bit more of this or a little bit more of that. Uh, so, and, and, and ask for that feedback, right? Say, Hey, Boss, I'm going to start doing this. What do you think? I think that that's a really uh, mature way to approach individual contributions at work, uh, especially in the remote environment. Uh, and I think it's a, a, even more important to keep in mind that what's obvious to you is not obvious to others. You're going to have to do more communicating, more explaining. Uh, and this is really about kind of cultivating your own leadership capabilities uh, in and of yourself, because you don't need a title to be a leader. Yeah, I mean, that was been all through my consulting career and back when I worked in uh, learning and development in an enterprise size organization. And, you know, I'd say, well, we don't have to teach that. Surely they know it. <laughs> and then after you do the instruction design and all that other stuff, and you find it's like, oh, no, they, they needed some more work on these foundational items. Uh, and, and even mention, say, hey, guys, I'm falling new on this team. We have um, a podcast where we talk about transitioning into new roles. Um, which we can put into the show notes. But, you know, you say, hey, at first I'm going to over communicate because I just don't want to miss anything. And just let people know you're over communicating and they'll, they'll dial the volume down, down for you. Sure, sure. You know, I think it's also helpful if you as the individual contributor look for better ways to get things done. You can do this thing we call job crafting, where you kind of create your own job in some ways and, you know, make it what it needs to be for both yourself and for the organization with, you know, good collaboration with your management team. Uh, offer suggestions on, on ways to do things better. That can be really, really helpful. Another piece that I would definitely recommend for anyone in a remote work environment, uh, be, be you a, a, an individual contributor or even a manager, is you got to watch out for your own well-being. This is huge, right? Especially if you're working at home all the time. If you can, if you're home supports it, try to have a distinct place in your home where you do your work. Create a schedule for yourself. This will be helpful for you to have a sense of stability. You know, one kind of potentially superficial or silly idea, but I think there's some merit to it, is, you know, maybe even consider wearing different clothes while you work, right? Put on something that's a little different than what you normally would wear that day, um, and then change out of them at the end of the day. And the reason for this is it kind of provides you with a, a psychological demarcation between work and non-work. You know, maybe if you, even if it's just from going from shorts to jeans and no back pants to shorts. to pants. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely recommend at least pants, right? So I, I think that's a helpful thing for, for you to do. Um, just to give, you, give yourself that mindset that, hey, now I'm doing something different. I'm going to move back to a non-work environment. I'm going to change my clothes and uh, and get back to family time or whatever. Yeah, and for those of you that have been, you know, doing this and they're going to start bringing you back, you maybe want to negotiate, you know, that kind of thing. Take a look at what's going on in your day-to-day, week-to-week. Are your hours really coming down because you're saving commute or are you working during those commute? Yeah. You know, some people miss the commute because they're like, you know, 30 minutes work, 30 minutes back. There was one hour a day where nobody could mess with me except the numbskulls driving their cars around me, right? Yeah. And so just be looking at that because some of these guys are going to require a pay cut or a, you know, there's going to be a lot of that stuff. Make sure you're taking a realistic look at what work from home has meant for you because, you know, with COVID and all this other stuff, you know, maybe it was a better scenario. But yeah. looking at making that an ongoing piece of what your work life looks like and where you're trying to take you or if you have a family or people that you're with that are on this cohort of life, you know, take take an honest assessment of that. It's not all, you know, roses. And certainly one very concrete thing that you could suggest to your boss if you're not commuting anymore is you, you know, you could say, hey, boss, you know, because I'm not commuting anymore and I'm not having to make that transition, you know, into my workspace as much. Um, I would like to use some time every week 
on on the company's dollar, um, you know, to listen to the Indigo podcast because that just really helps me flourish at work and beyond. So, you know, I think that's an important piece for for everyone out there to certainly tell their bosses about. Yeah, listen to the Indigo podcast. <laughs> Let's promote this guy now. Yeah, that's right. That's how. <laughs> hey, hey, it works for Filson, right? So today on the Indigo podcast, we've talked about the leadership challenge of remote and flexible work. We talked about what's actually going on right now. We did a little unpacking of the leadership challenge faced by many executives and managers, along with some implications for people, leaders, and organizations. Thanks for listening to the Indigo podcast. If you like this podcast, please consider helping us by rating us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen, telling your friends about us, having us on your podcast, or mentioning us on social media. Our website is www.indigopodcast.com, where you can access more information about us and this episode. Thanks again, and we look forward to talking with you again soon.